Hello and welcome. This is a ninth lecture dealing with light and its impacts on stream ecology offered here at St. Mary's College of Maryland during the summer of 2020. Light is a really important element of stream ecology as we've already pointed to in the prior lecture which dealt with temperature. And that's because of course light imparts uh, energy to systems and therefore creates changes in the temperature of those systems. But light has other important implications for stream ecology as well that are not directly related to just temperature. Many, many organisms rely on light for a variety of different reasons, and it has modifications to a number of different systems. And just as a reminder here, we are moving very rapidly through our list of major physical features. And at the conclusion of this particular lecture, we will be done with sort of the major abiotic view of stream ecology, and we will move on towards a biotic view of stream ecology. And again, as per normal, the objectives are listed here. And certainly we need to understand why light is important to streams by the end of this lecture explain how things like the contribution of light changes in response to a variety of different factors, including humans. And then we, I am going to actually introduce biology to a, a small degree here by talking about adaptations to light in the aquatic environment. One that you can already see on this image is the, is the evolution and maintenance of eyes, uh, and also the production of colored compounds in organisms both of which are in response to uh, the availability of light in the aquatic systems here as in stream fish. As with the prior lecture, I would recommend you think about this question before you continue to listen to me, but think about this. How does light change in streams? Same thing as we saw before, seasonally related also to plant cover and latitude. Temporally, there's something about depth, altitude, turbidity, organismal manipulation. All these things will alter light in streams. Average solar radiation, of course, is related to how much sunlight hits the surface of the Earth. And from this map, you can see that that's predominantly located in the tropical regions. But you'll also notice that it is actually quite high in some regions that are not found in the tropics. And that is, of course, related to altitude, right? So altitude has an important impact on the availability of solar radiation. And solar radiation is important for a variety of reasons. It provides the ability for organisms to see, right? So sunlight provides access for light in the environment. It provides energy to systems that can be used by plants. It can also be used to heat the system. And it also provides damaging uh, forms of energy like UV, right? So things in uh, higher alpine areas are going to have to deal with issues associated with the uh, abundance of UV light that things lower in the atmosphere are going to have less of a difficult time with or things that live in deeper waters will not have as many issues with. Remember, the reason for this is that their light is not simply the light that you can see. Visible light is a very narrow amount of the total wavelength of light that's available. Uh, it is just a little tiny bit. It's an important element of that, but it's very important to understand that light has uh, many different wavelengths and some of the important ones are things like infrared, which actually do heat water. The other one that I've already mentioned is UV and you can see that's, that's beyond the purple side of that spectrum. UV is very damaging because it's very, very high intensity energy. Uh, and that type of light does impact the Earth very, very fr frequently, uh, continuously with the other types of light. So in a typical day, the sun is producing all sorts of energy. Many of those wavelengths are impacting the surface of the Earth. Some of them are uh, this wavelength that, it, or I should say wavelengths that are in the UV spectrum. Some of that is absorbed in the stratosphere. Others of it is absorbed in the ozone or it is highly absorbed in the ozone in the troposphere. Some of it penetrates all the way to Earth. Now you may have heard the importance of the ozone layer and this is one of the major reasons the ozone layer is important for us. Because of its ability to absorb UV light, or at least some kinds of UV light, it has important implications for organisms. And that's also gonna have important implications for stream ecology because the type of light reaching streams will be different. Very, very high intensity uh, energy sunlight, UV light, is potentially very damaging to plants and animals, right? It can literally burn plants. 
in the same way that your skin gets burned when it's exposed to these types of lights. So the damage that is caused by those types of lights occur in all types of organisms. So the ozone is very, very important to protecting us from those kind of high intensity UV rays. And it should also be noted that because ozone is built from oxygen, there must have been a period in Earth's history where the ozone layer was either very thin or non-existent. One of the things that people often associate with ozone is an ozone hole. There is in fact a hole in the ozone or an area with very, very low ozone concentration. It tends to be focused over Antarctica, so it doesn't have necessarily a direct impact on the uh, many of the streams that we talk about, but I'll still bring it up because it's important to see. And some of the implications from a uh, management perspective and the, the modifications of large uh, developmental responses across multinational uh, uh, bodies are well demonstrated by the addressing of the ozone hole. Now there was a period of time when the ozone hole did not exist. Uh, that is as recently as the 19, you can see 70s. Uh, there's no large depletion of ozone at that point. And you can see that in the early 2000s, the ozone depletion was, was fairly extreme. Uh, this caused a serious amount of radiation to impact in Antarctica, which again, for most people is not as concerning because we don't live there. But had you been there, right, skin cancer rates uh, would have gone up in that sense. What caused the ozone hole? First thing I should do is clarify what ozone is. Ozone is very similar in structure to something else you know, that being water, and it should not surprise you that this is the case, but it is composed of only oxygen. Now, oxygens are not particularly enamored with other oxygens. There's a number of issues associated with this, one of which is that one of the oxygens is gonna be left, or I should say the oxygen is gonna be left with a relatively positive charge in some locations, a relatively negative charge in others locations. And oxygen tends to prefer relatively negative charges. O2, as a result, can be produced from ozone fairly easily with, a, with the breakdown of ozone. So, one of the things that can occur is that with a little bit of energy, you can split ozone into O2. Uh, and that, uh, that can occur in either direction. You can either produce ozone with a little bit of energy. So if, if you uh, are out during a lightning storm and you smell the air changing, one of the things that you're actually smelling is ozone. Uh, but it can also just occur uh, through the passage of time, it will eventually decay. The other thing that is really important to understand is that ozone is very, very sensitive to compounds called CFCs. This catalyzes the reaction of ozone to make O2, and CFCs are a common commercial or were a common commercial product uh, that were released into the atmosphere. CFCs are these uh, carbon compounds bound to chlorines and fluorines, chlorinated fluorocarbons. And the important element here is that when they are exposed to sunlight in very, very high altitude scenarios, they release this very unusual chlorine atom which bounces around and it acts as a catalyst to react with ozone to make O2. This means that it can keep reacting with that ozone and so that reaction, it just rapidly speeds up the production of O2 from ozone. Okay, none of this is particularly interesting to people, but the important thing to understand is that CFCs were extremely widely used. Uh, in the 60s, 70s, um, they, were, they were produced and added to a lot of materials. CFCs are really phenomenal for a variety of reasons. They are unreactive with a lot of different items. So they are not problematic uh, to add to lots of different chemicals. They are phenomenal lubricants uh, and they have good uh, expansion and uh, properties so that you can use them in things like refrigerants. The problem is that they were placed in, there were numerous amounts of these compounds made. They were released, of course, in the atmosphere. For instance, they were used to pressurize cans. This person is releasing CFCs. They're of no danger to him right now, but they were released in the atmosphere and they would degrade the ozone layer. The threat of CFCs was identified uh, and there was a global response to that. Uh, companies and uh, governments responded very rapidly. They produced this thing called the Montreal Protocol. Companies rapidly phased out use of CFCs in products and now you, it's very actually very hard to find CFCs in products. And governments started to ban uh, new products with them. So there is a lot of response and that resulted in 
the rapid decline of CFCs being reduced. Now, the CFCs that are still in our atmosphere degrade the ozone layer and they cause uh, the loss of that ozone. But thankfully, at some point, they will decay uh, and there will be ozone will build back up again. I do want to stress that people frequently get ozone layer and climate change intermixed. These are not related items. They are only related in the sense that they both come from industrialized nations. This has nothing to do one with the other. So climate change is not caused by an ozone hole and the ozone hole does not speed up climate change. And you can see here, here's some predictions about where we'll be. By 2100, our ozone hole will have been fully closed um, is an estimate right now. We are right there in about the 2020s. You can see that we're climbing back up from a low that occurred in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s. All right, so why did I spend all this time talking about UV light and ozone? Well, one of the things that I wanna to stress to you is that streams and stream organisms are exposed to UV light all the time. They are in the water. They don't have a lot of cover in many cases and the light will penetrate and hit them. Just as when you go swimming, you need to put on a lot of sunscreen for a variety of reasons. One is it washes off slowly as you swim, but also because you're very, very vulnerable to being burned by the sun, uh, stream organisms are also gonna face that challenge. So incident light can be important for a variety of reasons. One of those reasons, of course, is that it allows things like plants to grow and actually provides the fundamental energy that drives many of these stream processes. But two, it also causes damage to organisms. So keep that in mind. All the prior stuff we just went through is a long way for me to say light is important, but it's also damaging. And that shouldn't really be a surprise to you. I already had this particular image and I liked it a lot, so I reused it. Uh, but this deals with the amount of light that enters a stream through time in a seasonal temperate body of water. Now, this is very different in, say, a tropical system. A tropical system will tend to look more like the summertime view of a temperate stream, but tropical systems are often characterized by large flooding events. And during large flooding events, the water spreads out across that floodplain, and it may in fact look more like something like a spring situation, where uh, as that water spreads out onto its floodplain, there are fewer and fewer plants that can obstruct that entry of water or the entry of light into the water, and you get a lot of phenomenal growth because of that, and also nutrients are available at that time. But let's step back and think about this from a temperate stream view, because that's what we are often surrounded by. And again, I will stress that if you are interested in tropical or Arctic or other types, high altitude uh, streams, you should think about uh, how would I go about studying those and spend time looking at specialist literature on that? Because the view that we have is a general view and it often embodies much of the temperate stream literature. All right, so in the spring, what is happening is plants are returning uh, to an active state they, I should say terrestrial plants, they are producing uh, leaves and they are beginning to intercept light, but they have not yet fully grown all their leaf material back out yet. And the canopy therefore is not very protective of the stream. So during the spring, a lot of light is uh, uh, striking the bottom of the stream. At the same time, right, because there are often large amounts of rain events that are occurring, nutrients are being washed into that stream. And so this is a really productive time for algae. As you approach the summer, the amount of rain declines pretty drastically. Temperatures are also rising, so evaporation goes up pretty considerably, and plants are respiring a lot. So they're actually pulling water out of the ground and they're lowering the total amount of water in the stream. Light is also now being largely intercepted uh, by plants along the edge of the stream. And so things like algal production are gonna go, go down. It should be noted that in very, very large streams where plants play only a marginal role in the sort of the history of the uh, total area of the stream, they're just, they're, they're just at the very fringes, then the amount of light actually striking the stream does not go down so considerably, right? So in large, slow moving streams, you're gonna have very productive areas in the summertime as something like the Mississippi, which has traditionally been a very slow flowing and very, very broad stream with actually a fairly shallow draft. So a lot of nutrients are resuspended pretty constantly. And that is one of the reasons that the Mississippi was so productive uh, for so long. Many of those characters have been significantly reduced or modified since then because of the way in which this, that river has been modified for things like navigation and transport.
But in any case, in the summertime, when we think of streams, small streams especially, there's going to be a lot of capture of light before it enters the stream. And so the amount available to things like algae and other organisms is going to decline pretty drastically. The other thing that's going to happen is if you've ever been underneath a tree, it's not random what light reaches you, right? The vast majority of the photosynthetic light or light that's good for photosynthesis is being intercepted. The light that may pass on is actually light that has been selected in a sense. So the, the plants are removing the wavelengths that are most productive and they're passing through other light. So when you stand out in the open, it might feel very yellowish, right? A very bright white yellowish light. And when you stand under trees, the color shifts. You don't get those same colors, right? The trees are reflecting greenish lights, which they are not using, okay? In the fall, what is happening is the plants are beginning to uh, defoliate, right? So they're losing all these leaves. It's so deciduous, so the trees are going to lose their leaves in the fall. As they do that, they remove some of those compounds, and now certain types of light are not being intercepted. They are also releasing nutrients because these leaves are being dropped to the ground and they will be flushed into streams where they will be attacked by a variety of things, including organisms and bacteria, which will, uh, organisms and bacteria, organisms, including bacteria, fungi, and animals. And those will release those nutrients into these bodies of water. So the fall in the temperate zone is often another time of relative abundance of light in streams. And it is therefore also a time of relative good growth of algae. So if you go out in the middle of the summer, you will often see that the, the rocks have a thin layer of algae on them. And if you come back in a few weeks in the middle of fall, what you will find is that the algae is much thicker, um, it's much more abundant, and then if you wait through the winter and come back in the spring, you will find that the algae is at sort of a maximum at that point. Uh, usually in the, it will decline at the end of the fall and into the winter. In the winter time, all that's usually left in the, in the way of the light entering the stream is some small amount of plants. Often it's plant bodies, right? It's, it's this large woody material that blocks sunlight but it is usually not very much in the way of greenery. This is not entirely true. If you go into pine forests, streams that run through pine forests are gonna have a very different view, right? It will tend to look more like a summer world almost constantly uh, in that sense because you're not having large amounts of leaf litter and you're not losing a lot of leaves and the leaves continue to filter light, uh, even if the plant's metabolism is much, much slower at that point. So those types of systems may be very different. Uh, the other thing that's happening, of course, in the winter is that there is usually a fair amount of water added to these systems. So the depth of the, the stream is usually relatively high, albeit that there's also things like snow and ice. So the amount of water actually entering the stream is variable. Sometimes it can be quite low and sometimes it can be quite high. And in areas that tend to be very, very cold, the amount of water entering is fairly low until you get closer into the spring. So these are some of the ways in which light changes, right? And I want you to understand that therefore the, the stream itself, the view of light in the stream changes across the year. It's also obvious that light changes across a day. There is a long period of time during a day when the light levels decline very markably. I will not say they reach zero. It is not true that light truly reaches a zero level, right? If you have ever been outside when there's a full moon, you will see that you have very good eyesight, right? And you are very able to detect things under a full moon. It's really not unless there is no moon that you have a hard time seeing things. And even then you can often still make stuff out as long as it's close to you. So this is true of many organisms. The light levels are actually still fairly noticeable in very bright nights, nights that are associated with things like a full moon. Organisms uh, pr cannot make it, uh, I should say plants cannot make it in the sense that they can't pay for their metabolism uh, with the photosynthesis they do, but they may have some extremely low level of photosynthetic activity even. There is also, to be clear, in a human modified system, light levels may remain extremely high at night, right? Very high, in fact, even as close to something like twilight because of things like uh, street lights turning on. And it may also be very localized, that there may be a high amount of light in one area and then it returns to a fairly dark area somewhere else. Or it may be long stretches are in fact lit, right? So you think about that as well. 
You will also, of course, anticipate that the daily changes, it will be uh, more extreme in a well-covered stream, in a stream that has a lot of canopy cover. Those streams will tend to appear uh, or to tend to have much more light absorbed long before it reaches the stream bed itself. And so as the sun starts to set, the light level is going to drop off very, very quickly. If you are in a high Arctic system, of course, then it's going to be very different depending on whether it's the summertime or the winter. During the summertime, the light level may remain extremely high day all day, right? It may for 24 hours, you may really not have a period where there's a darkness at all. So having been in Alaska during the summertime, this is extremely disconcerting. Uh, and it's actually really problematic for organisms because think about all the advantages that night gives you. It allows nocturnal predators to hunt, right? It allows prey species to hide. It allows organisms to rest. Uh, and if you have to watch out for predators 24 seven, which occurs for a period of time in the high Arctic, that's going to be a hugely costly adventure for you and you're going to have to figure out how to sleep in a very exposed situation right and you're not going to have a good indication of when it's nighttime one of the things that's hardest to do in places like alaska when there is no obvious night is to understand when you're supposed to go to sleep it'll be 11 o'clock at night and it will look like um 11 a.m right and it it feels unnatural it, it to actually lay down and try to go to sleep just as, as a as someone who's been there uh, and many Alaskans have very thick curtains as a result of that to help block out the sunlight so they can artificially control light levels to themselves and maintain something like a light and a dark cycle but organisms out in the middle of the stream will not have that so these are really interesting differences in nocturnal and diurnal behavior that are going to have to be modulated in a world where there is no uh, faithful indicator of what time of day it is. And just as a reminder, here's a great example. So this is twilight with the moon. Look at the, the moon is extremely large in this particular image, depending on how close it is, that makes sense. But a huge amount of light is actually being reflected off the moon. That's what's happening, right? And the moon is a fairly whitish surface. There is some gray on it as well and some dark areas that absorb a lot of light. But a lot of it is actually highly reflective and that reflected light travels back to Earth, or I should say travels to Earth because it actually struck the moon and then is coming to Earth. And that light can do a very nice job of lighting up whole stretches. So it may drastically extend uh, something like a twilight zone, right? Because it extends the amount of time that organisms can hunt by providing enough sunlight for them to see. Uh, and it can also provide nighttime animals uh, quite a bit more light than they would get, say, if there was no moon, right? There's a considerable amount of energy that's still striking the system as a result of that. Another important thing to keep in mind is that light is very, very sensitive to depth and the type of light is very, very sensitive to depth. Not all lights travel evenly through depth. So what you can see from this, there are very few streams that would even approach 100 meters deep, but very many streams would approach 10 meters deep. That's not an uncommon. And so you're already starting to see loss of some wavelengths at that point. The order of loss is that reds are absorbed first, and purples are absorbed last in that in in uh, the water column and so that means that to see red light you really have to be very very close to the surface of the water but to see purple and blue light you can be very very deep because those wavelengths can keep penetrating in large streams as a result of that the shift is going to tend to be towards the blue region right in very very shallow streams you'll have almost no shift at all right in very small headwater streams that are only a millimeters to centimeters deep this shift is going to be almost undetectable because it's it's too too shallow to make a difference but in streams that are even a few meters deep you're going to start to see shifts pretty quickly in the direction of that blue light purple light zone the other thing i want you to think about is think about light attenuation in water i mentioned that it changes with color and that when you get down you get a blue shift right you get towards the blues and these purples what colors do you see in these images here? You should be seeing uh, greens. You should be seeing some some reds, some yellows, and uh, maybe some blue and black, right? So what am I? What is going on here? Well, these waters are very very shallow, correct? 
So these waters are waters that are only a few meters deep. So you're going to see organisms that tend to be shifted towards that green, yellow, blue zone because these are shallow waters. Are these the same or different from what you would see in marine waters? These are great examples of just pictures of marine waters, and I really like the way in which they show you how blue that water is, right? Look at how blue that is. These are much deeper. What you were seeing in the prior pictures were a meter to two meters deep, not much. That one on the bottom of that brightly colored orange fish, that's probably in the order of centimeters. Now take a look at this environment. You're looking at a world that is tens of meters deep immediately. And that tens of meter deep has a profound impact. So you're seeing these really dark opal blues already, right? You see them all around. And you see organisms with very different color schemes. So why is this different? Well, it has to do with that attenuation. All of the low light is already attenuated. Those, little, those much uh, redder colors are already gone. How might we detect this in stream fishes and how might we look for some pattern in stream fishes relative to marine fishes then? So if you look at fishes in fresh waters, you might be able to do something like take the average color on their body or you might measure some different colors on their body and compare that with other uh, patterns in say a marine fish and what you will tend to find is that the fish that we have in freshwater are much more yellow and brown okay those yellows and browns make sense that's shifted towards that red spectrum it also looks a lot like that turbidity so it'll make them very hard to see many 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 marine fish have this silvery color and that silvery color is really useful at scattering light in an environment where light is very easy to detect, but it tends to be shifted towards the blue. So you want to scatter that away from yourself and spread it out because a, prey, a predator is going to be able to see tens of meters away from you. Whereas in a freshwater system, a predator may see just a few meters. So in a, in a saltwater system, you need to scatter that light to diffuse that outline that is your body so that you will disappear more rapidly at distance. Many organisms move between these two systems, and I have picked here salmon because people get really excited about salmon. But salmon have to transition from a freshwater to a saltwater, from a saltwater back to a freshwater at some point. And when they do that, they have to change their whole body in lots of different ways. But one of the ways is they have to change from a coloration that is useful at uh, hiding them in fresh water to a coloration that is actually harmful. That scattering of light acts like a little flashing lure uh, in a very dark system, right? It makes it very easy to find you. But in a very bright system, it helps to diffuse the light very rapidly and helps to hide you. So these types of organisms have a real trade-off at, at stake here. Light is such an important commodity in streams, and it's so critical to stream ecology. But they need to they need to escape it. At the same time, as they transition from these different colors, there's going to be a period where they're not adapted to any environment and they'll be very, very vulnerable doing that. So when you see these types of things, think about how they interact with their predators. Think about how they interact with other organisms. Think about how these organisms are making trade-offs to use different habitats. The other thing that's going to drive the attenuation of light is going to be this thing called turbidity. Turbidity is suspended material in the water column. And there can be a lot of reasons for turbidity. One that people are often associated with things like soils and sediments, which get suspended. Turbidity can be uh, really rapid. So for instance, you can have a loss of almost all of your light within just a few meters. And there are many rivers which are highly turbid and five meters is not very deep. And there are many, many rivers where the vast majority or effectively all of the light that would be suitable for photosynthesis anyway is absorbed in the first few meters because of that turbidity issue. There are, however, many rivers that run through areas where there isn't much erosion or entrance of material and they can be extremely clear. One of the things that humans are enamored with is clear waters. They think that these are pristine waters. Pristine waters are uh, only in the sense that the human eye has evolved uh, an association with clear waters with a good thing. Okay, So the reason that humans are enamored with very clear waters is because it is a very helpful trait 
to think to yourself, ah, this water is very clear. It is trustworthy. I don't have any way to look for microorganisms, right? This is prior to med modern medical science. So what is a good indicator that there are very few parasites or pathogens in water? Well, if the water is really clear, that in fact suggests not much is living in it. If not much is living in it, that probably means not much can hurt you. So humans often think about very clear water as a, as a good form of water. You don't see people often saying, I really love my water nice and brown and turbid. That suggests that there's a lot of things growing in it or a lot of things eroding into it and therefore maybe pathogens and parasites. And it's a good indication you probably shouldn't be drinking that water. It is not true, however, that clear water is a universal sign that there is uh, no parasites or pathogens. So be careful when you're out camping. Make sure that you uh, do go ahead and sterilize your water in some fashion before you consume it. In very, very clear systems, though, you can have light that penetrates down 20 meters. 20 meters is a long way. You're talking about mm, in the order of 50 to 100 feet that you can still detect light with your eye uh, at that level. The importance of uh, light itself um, in, in these systems is also noticeable because the turbidity is going to be related to things inside the watershed like humans themselves. So humans are going to vastly increase things like erosion and that it, or I should say can vastly increase things like erosion. And so that will change how the stream functions. You may go from a stream that has relatively few nutrients in it and has relatively clear water to a stream that's far more turbid and has far more nutrients in it. And the turbidity is going to have a really profound impact on organisms themselves. The one that I'm going to focus on right now is how organisms uh, modify their detection of light through turbidity. Many, many organisms have adapted to uh, differences in light. This example I have over here is a largemouth bass. Largemouth bass have very large eyes positioned very far forward on their head. And they are very, very visually perceptive of prey items. So as they move around, they will be searching for prey and they use that to help them locate and attack targets. They also are very sensitive to overhead threats. So they use these eyes to detect things that are above them. So in systems where turbidity is high, they have a hard time hunting and they also have a hard time uh, detecting overhead threats, although the overhead threats may have a hard time actually seeing them in the water. So there's some sort of trade-off between the two. Light is, of course, a constant thing that we have to think about in streams because of the numerous number of things that it causes to change, not least of which uh, things like visual predators. But it's also going to change things like temperature and when things are actually active. And we would anticipate that because this is a constant uh, pressure that we see in the aquatic system, we should see lots of adaptations to it. And of course, we absolutely do. So here's an animal that lives in the Mississippi River. This lives much further down in the watershed, usually in, in fairly large rivers. At that point, there is a lot of material that has washed off the land, usually. The waters are often very productive, and they are therefore very, very cloudy and dark. This animal has evolved to eat small organisms. And it doesn't locate them with an eye. You can see just a little tiny remnant of an eye left. It's almost vestigial. It actually uses a very sensitive electrosensitive organ out here. And if you want to know how sensitive it is, it's so sensitive that it can, it can individually detect a plankton swimming around in front of the fish. And it will then know to swim towards that particular plankton item and suck it in. And the way that we know that it can detect an individual plankton item is that you can take uh, a brine shrimp or what people call sea monkey, uh, you can put one of them in a fish tank in front of this organism and it'll reorient to that organism. But if you put it in a gel that absorbs uh, electrochemical signals, then that it will not orient towards it. So it will not be able to detect it at that point. So it is very, very sensitive to these small changes. And as a result, organisms like this, which is ca called a paddlefish, are found in streams and rivers that have relatively high turbidity uh, and that would have very difficult times for visually sighted planktonic feeders to work in. We also find uh, adaptations to light in numerous other places, right? Often animals that live in high turbidity systems begin to lose or have very reduced eyesight. You can see that here with this catfish is a much reduced eyesight. Catfish do have eyesight, they can see, but they are not highly reliant on it like many other organisms in the stream are. And they will often have very highly sensitive structures that contain a lot of 
uh, things like taste buds. So these whiskers on a catfish are very, very sensitive. And they're very, very useful at detecting food items in a low light system. And they can actually use these uh, to feel around on the bottom, sort of like you would if you were in a very dark room and you were feeling around with your finger. The advantage that things like this catfish have is that it can also taste them with, they're not fingers, but if, if we're gonna use that analogy, it would be as if you could taste with the tips of your fingers. That turns out to be very useful because if you touch something in your closet, you may not know what it is, but if you happen to taste it and you went, oh, ah, I left that toothpaste in that, that coat pocket or that, that edge of that container over here by my, uh, by my other toiletries, then you would be, I think, dissatisfied. But if you were, say, a catfish and you were tasting a little bug at the bottom, then you could scoop it in but never have actually seen the bug itself. There's lots of adaptations to living in different light environments, and these are some of them. Turbidity comes from two major sources, and I've already started to allude to this now. There are small particles of inorganic material. That's what you see on the two pictures, the picture in the middle and the picture to the right. They tend to be small. We often associate them browns, maybe whites. Uh, these are colors that are associated, at least the brown color is associated with things like iron, rust, uh, and organic molecules that are creating that uh, brownish color. Additionally to that, turbidity is also caused by phytoplankton. Now, phytoplankton, like you see in that picture on the left, probably more likely to occur in lake systems. However, in slow flowing streams, phytoplankton levels can reach fairly high concentrations and they can in fact cause a reasonable amount of turbidity. Uh, and especially in systems that are fed high levels of nutrients, Phytoplankton can be a significant source of turbidity and modify how much light is reaching them. So if you swam to the bottom of that stream and looked up, right, your view of the world would be very, very dark relative to a view where you had removed all that phytoplankton from it. And that's going to have really different uh, influences on the ecology of the organisms within it. One of the cool things is that you can actually see turbidity really easily in water. These are two streams that are meeting each other. The one, this is a natural system. This is not, the, 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 that sort of weird bluish color is actually related to uh, the calcium carbonate or the, the calcium carbonate that the stream passes over. And it creates this uh, really opal blue. But it is, you can see meeting a water that is largely loaded with very fine sediments. And that water is sort of a brown color, suggesting there's uh, all sorts of things like iron in it. And that reaction takes time. So if you're an organism that lives in one of these streams, it may not behoove you to go into the other. Uh, what, that water clearly is going to have a very different concentration of different types of light in each one. Organisms themselves beyond humans can also change turbidity, of course. We already mentioned black flies. They collect particulate out of the water, and that actually makes the streams clearer. But you can also have organisms like nutria that burrow and release sediments and soils into the river themselves and also in, uh, cause erosion. You can have organisms like mussels that are filter feeding, right, and removing large amounts of material and secreting it or, or depositing it onto the sediment itself. So there's many, many ways in which organisms themselves actually impact turbidity, and it can go either direction. It depends on what organism you're talking about. One that I do like is carp. So carp in the United States are non-native. You, the debate about whether we use the words here non-native or invasive is probably best saved for another lecture. Uh, generally, we call them non-native species. Carp are very, very large organisms. You can see here, this is a considerable sized animal. These are not particularly uncommon. We could go out and get them fairly easily from almost any large water body in the US. But carp love to root around at the bottom of the sediments. And when they do that, they stir up a lot of sediments. They also pull plants up and they help it suspend and resuspend material. So they, they keep uh, waters relatively well uh, mixed. You can see here's a very simple experiment. Here is an area, oop, I'm gonna use red. I don't like this yellow color. Here's an, here is an area where carp were allowed. Then they put a barrier right here across the lake because it had to pass under a highway. So they put a barrier there and they removed all the carp on this side. And what you can see is just a huge difference in turbidity and therefore light. So over here, turbidity is high and it tends to be brown. 
suggesting that it's going to be inorganic and organic molecules that are blocking light from penetrating down into that waterway. And over here, it tends to be relatively blue, which suggests that light is able to penetrate relatively deep into the waterway. And that will do things like allow more plants to grow. It will also do things like change what types of algae are available to organisms within there, or change what type of organisms are preferred. In these brown waters over on the left, you're going to have organisms that have to be less reliant on eyesight or have to be reliant on very nearsighted things so they can only see their prey at the last moment. Where on the right, you'll have visual predators that can probably see for feet to meters at a time before they approach their prey. So you're going to have very different worlds to live in. You might have differences in what birds are using it, right? The birds need to see their prey when they're striking it. So you may, be, may have an area where birds prefer one side or the other. And that's just an example of sort of these knock-on effects that single organisms can have. This is a very classic example of what carp can do in systems. Uh, they're non-native because, I should have clarified this earlier, they're non-native because all the carp in the U.S. are brought from Europe. Humans, of course, modify streams very heavily. We talked about uh, some of this already, but uh, it just goes to show that these interact in many, many different ways. But light levels are changed pretty dramatically by the way in which humans uh, modify systems. So, of course, we've already mentioned things like erosion. Here's a great example of that. There's a lot of erosion occurring in this area because of the way that this land has been stripped of, it, of its woody debris. Here's an area, too, uh, where erosion is being allowed to occur. And if you do have cows, please, please, please fence them off from the streams. It helps to protect the streams dramatically uh, and helps to retain land uh, by removing them from the streams themselves. They do a lot of damage to these streams and cause huge amounts of erosion. And in addition to that, they've really seriously modified how much light is entering the stream, right? So this stream, look at it here. Back here, it's passing through a forest. Probably most of that light is being absorbed long before it reaches a stream bottom. The amount that's actually available is going to be relatively tiny. Up here, it's almost every every photon of light that, that is reaching the surface of the Earth is striking that stream itself, right? So there is no attenuation. So the organisms that have to live here are going to be very, very different than the organisms that live just over here, right? And the, you can expect to see that the organisms in this high intensity uh, light environment are going to rely on uh, very different things than the organisms in the low intensity light environment. Now these are, I'm showing you examples from an agricultural system, but I want to be clear that changing in light uh, availability is very common also in urban systems. And we already saw a bit of that when we talked about temperature and streams. All right, the next thing we're going to discuss now that we've talked a little bit about light is this, autochthonous resources. Autochthonous resources are, of course, food that grows in the stream. 